Well, you can say one thing from Mike. You can say that he never gets tired of talking about this series. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back today to talk some more First Law Universe, and we're kicking it off right back at the very beginning, guys, with 2007's The Blade itself. Now, this was a series that was very eye-opening to me when it came out, and that's why this is, guys, is going to kind of be my first, like, re-review on the channel, I guess you call it. When I first started the channel, I did some spoiler reviews of these, just because of uh, trying to encourage more people to kind of read this series. And I really didn't know what the format was going to be for the channel yet. So I said, I want to go back and give these the current review format that I have. So there's where we are. By the way, I didn't get that nice new edition that they've been putting out, I think, on uh, Broken Binding. Is that who's doing it? Uh, anyway, my friends in the UK have been showing me the pictures, and they're absolutely beautiful. But I'll have to stick with my original book club edition that I got years ago. And, of course, these new special editions, anniversary editions they put out before. Uh, but, uh, you know... I won't lie, I do wish I had gotten those those new ones. But guys, uh, this is a series that for me, background-wise, was something that kind of popped up out of nowhere for me in the frustration of waiting for A Dance with Dragons by George R. R. Martin, which is funny in hindsight. But we're not going to make this video about that. We're going to make this about First Law. But a friend of mine recommended, hey, while you're tired of waiting for that, why don't you try some other series? And, you know, but at the time, I just felt like, ah... No one's really given me what George R. R. Martin has given me because everything is just traditional fantasy, good guy, bad guy, wizards and dragons and stuff like that. So, okay, why don't you try this series out? And if you don't like it, hey, quit. But, you know, what else are you going to do right now? Read A Song of Ice and Fire again? And I was like, well, maybe. But I went ahead and picked it up. And thankfully, the first question I asked him was, is this series complete? Because I was very frustrated about uh, A Song of Ice and Fire. He said, yes, actually, the last book did come out like three months ago. So at the time, it was just a trilogy. And I picked it up. And guys, I speed ran that series. And it completely changed everything for me. Because I realized that there was really good modern fantasy out there by people not named George R. R. Martin. So I will always be thankful to this genre for that. And it was just something that was so completely different for me. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. So, guys, before we do that, we're going to do like usual. Let's get into what is this book about. Now, Logan Ninefingers, infamous barbarian, has finally run out of luck. Caught in one few too many, he's on the verge of becoming a dead barbarian, leaving nothing behind him but bad songs, dead friends, and a lot of happy enemies. Nobleman Captain Jazal Dan Luther, dashing officer and a paragon of selfishness, has nothing more dangerous in mind than fleecing his friends at cards and dreaming of glory in the fencing circle. But war is brewing, and on the battlefields of the frozen north, they fight by altogether bloodier rules. Inquisitor Galacta, cripple turned torturer, hates everyone, and cutting treason out of the Union one confession at a time leaves little room for friendship. His latest trail of corpses may lead him right to the rotten heart of government, if he can stay alive long enough to follow it. Enter the wizard Baez. He could be the mythical first of the Magi, or he could be a spectacular fraud. But whatever he is, He's about to make the lives of Logan, Jazal, and Glockta a whole lot more difficult. Murderous conspiracies rise to the surface, old scores are ready to be settled, and the line between hero and villain is sharp enough to draw blood. Guys, all the way back in 2007, this is The Blade itself, the first book of the First Law trilogy. Now, like we usually do, guys, we're going to talk about what makes this book good or bad. Without a doubt, I want to begin with the good here because the best thing about this book and this series, guys, is the characters. Say one thing for Joe Abercrombie. Say that he writes amazing characters. What he's able to do with his characters is differentiate them enough that you don't even have to see who is saying it. By the end of this series, you'll be reading dialogue and you'll know which character he's talking about. And something that really drew me to this, like I said, kind of like a Song of Ice and Fire away, was that it was morally great characters. It was no good and bad. Now, I know that sometimes I still like to go back to that. But at the time when I read this, I was so really just over that. I really needed something different. Song of Ice and Fire gave me that something different. This kind of built upon that. And I think what he does with his characters is he makes them so unique in that he is able to subvert expectations in every single way with them, but never in a way that feels insulting to the reader. It's always something that's like, oh, I didn't see that coming, but in a great way, you never felt like, 
that was lame. You know, you never feel like let down by it. It's always something that's really, really cool. And I, I just really dug that about his characters. Now, I know that Morley Gray is something that's very, very common in modern fantasy now. But back in uh, 2009, when I read this for the first time, uh, really this and Song of Ice and Fire was the only thing I had read that had really, really gotten into that. Now, Again, I'm not going to say this created the morally gray character. I'm saying it was one of my first real exposures to it because I thought that Song of Ice and Fire had morally gray characters. This had morally gray characters that leaned really gray. Let's put it that way. They leaned more towards the black than the white. Uh, but I, I really just dug that about it because it was one of those things where when you first start this book, you will feel like, these characters aren't like them. And I get that a lot. I get people, I tried reading, I just didn't like the characters. And I'm like, I want to say you're not supposed to, because I think that it's a kind of a thing where Joe takes a challenge. He says, I'm going to present these really unlikable characters. I'm going to have you rooting for them. And you're going to be asking yourselves why. And doggone if he doesn't do it. At least he did for me. So I would say stick with it because I think that you're going to find something that really keeps you stuck in this world. Even if you can't quite put your finger on it. I won't lie to you guys. My first time reading this trilogy, I couldn't put my finger on it. I'm not even sure I could do it today. But I think I have more of an idea why. But I love that these characters are all damage in a severe way, be it physical damage, be it a haunted past, be it emotional scars, or all the above, these characters all have something that is haunting them and something that either they're trying to keep hidden or something they're trying to run away from, or, you know, if they can't run in the case of Glockta. So uh, I, I just, I really did dig that about his characters. None of these guys felt like anything you'd ever seen in a fantasy story before. They felt real. They felt like they had real problems outside of what was going on with the like, conflict in the world. They had real personal life issues. And that's things that I was never able to really just get past for any other modern fantasy series. I don't feel like they've ever done it as well. I think that Brandon Sanderson writes some pretty good damaged characters, but sometimes I do think he tries too hard with that. With these, it just feels normal in this world because of how cruel and punishing this world is. And I'll talk about that world in a minute, but I want to continue with the characters here. I, I think the first book in this series is very much a character study of Glockta and West and Logan and Jazal here because uh, you really do get into what those guys' everyday lives is like. And that does have that some of that slice of life stuff that I always talk about that I love with Stephen King. I think you do get some of that here because a big common uh, feedback I get of this is like, well, yeah, I, I thought the book was interesting, but not like a lot of plot happened. And I think it's because this one is very much a character introduction. I do feel like this is one whole story told over three volumes. It is one story that was split into three ways. So you will kind of feel like it is very character introductory with this first episode. But I do think it is a very good character introduction because you, by the end of this book, you know what's going on with these characters. You know what's making them tick, but you still have lots of questions about them. So again, just a, just a master class in character work for a then debut author, Joe Abercrombie. I also want to talk about those named men up in the north. Uh, I mentioned Glockta and West and Logan and Giselle, but you got your named men up in the north led by Three Trees. And this is like uh, Logan's uh, old crew that he used to run with. And every one of these characters you will fall in love with by the end of this book, which is amazing because you think, oh, well, you know, they're just like some side characters maybe. I don't know. You know I felt that way when I first read it. And over time, uh, the course of this book, and of course this trilogy, you really do tend to fall in love with every single one of these guys. And it's just amazing because like I said, they do dark, dark shit. They really do. All these characters do some stuff that make you be like, if you saw this in real life, you'd be clutching your pearls, right? And in this year, it's kind of like, oh man, how about that, right? And I think a big reason why this stuff works, guys, is Joe Abercrombie's dialogue. Yes, it's very cussy, I've been told. It does have a lot of bad language, but that's not what makes it funny. I think what makes this getting from just straight into nihilism, which is a lot of other uh, grimdark problems, is uh, they just think that just make everything just completely just hopeless and brutal and make everybody just terrible people, is that's what makes grimdark go. With Joe, I feel like he keeps it from ever just you know falling into nihilism because he does write, write some really good twisted humor. It's very, very black humor, but it does work. It's surprising how well it works. It's, it's surprising in a book that's this stabby how often I find myself chuckling. You know, so I, I just think that his dialogue is just witty, it's sharp, it always keeps you on edge, and you'll be quoting stuff, guys, from this a lot after you read this book. You will find yourself quoting lines from this series in your everyday life, like I tend to. But uh, let's talk about that world now. Uh, well, in this world, I think it gets 
greater developed after this book. This book, you really focus on Adjua, which is the capital in this circle of the world, and you deal with the North, which is you know, obviously just over the sea there, and it's going to be uh, their adversaries, the, the Northmen. So you're getting to see point of view from both sides of this in this book, and that's where you got your North, your name men up in the North, and then you've got everyone else in Adjua here. But it's setting up, you know, the greater journey to come in the sequel books. But with this one, you really do kind of just focus on those, but you do get a good taste of this world, how cruel and, and just hopeless things can be. And obviously, the difference between Adjua and the North. It is very, very different ways of living between these two lands. And that is very much uh, written well by Mr. Abercrombie, I think, in setting up what this universe will eventually become. Another great thing in this series, guys, is the politics. That was something I always felt like no one could touch George R. R. Martin and the politics in these books and make you can make people just sitting at a table be the most tense thing that ever happens. This book, I would say, uh, this whole series is on par with A Song of Ice and Fire in politics for me. It's just as just, you know, backstabby and just betrayal and just crazy, crazy twists that you weren't expecting. And it's it's great stuff. It never feels forced. It always feels earned. It's always going to make your jaw hit the floor. And it begins with this very first book, as you see, with these different councils and the, uh, you know, the arch lector and all this stuff and the Inquisition. You see all these things going on in slow motion, and you're just there for the ride. I think he does his politics just great, and they never, ever seem boring. There's always stakes happening with every single decision in this series. And I just think, I can't think of another modern fantasy world that does politics as good as this, except for A Song of Ice and Fire. I feel like these really are on par with them. Low magic is something that I gotta say I like. If you're one of those people who needs a real, just complex magic system, you might find this a little dull. For me, I am over that. I don't need the magic to be a character. I don't mind it, but I do. I did grow up on Lord of the Rings, guys, and why could Gandalf do magic? Because he's a wizard. Same thing here. Why can Baez do magic? Because he's a wizard. That's fine by me. I don't need to know how the sausage is made on those things. But that's kind of, kind of a, a personal thing for you. But like I said, guys, it's never and he never insults you with the way that he subverts expectations. If you have read Lord of the Rings, you may be like, oh, okay, I know which way this is going to go. And it never goes that way. So yeah, I feel like it's almost, in a way, I've heard people say they feel like it is a deconstruction of Lord of the Rings. I don't necessarily think so, but I can see where they're coming from with some of those things. So if you are a big Lord of the Rings fan, you will eventually think, oh, he's going to zig this way, but he zags that way. And I think that that's something that, as a big Tolkien fan, that did, I did really like that. So uh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how you guys think about it. With me, uh, I think the hooks that he gives with these characters in this first book. You want to know about Logan's past. You want to know about how Galactica became this thing that he hates. You want to know if Wes can kind of escape his family demons. You want to know if jo Jazal can... Well, if he can do anything, you know, because you want to talk about an unlikable character in the first book, man, Jazal, it's 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 tough to read his chapters sometimes, but you know what? He just got a great chin. He's going to tell you about how great his chin is. But as always, guys, is any book perfect? Of course not, especially since this was a debut author. There are some problems with this book. Let's talk about those now. Uh, many gripe that nothing happens in this book. Now, while I disagree, I can see... A lot of modern fantasy readers picking this up and thinking uh, nothing really happened. For me, knowing what's to come, uh, there is stuff that's set up in this first book that doesn't pay off until book three. So I would just say, trust me that the things that you don't think matter will matter. So pay attention. Uh, reread sections if you must. But again, like this one, I said, I feel like this is very much just introducing you to these characters and this world and what things are very much like. So uh, I feel like it's very much this story is like a Lord of the Rings or like the Warlord Chronicles if you want to go something else like this in that it is just one story. It just It's just divided into three different volumes here. It literally is like the thing where like book two starts the next day. It's that kind of thing. There isn't no big layover between books. It is very much just like this could have been one large book. It's just, eh, we can't really sell it that way. So let's just go ahead and cut it into three different releases. So you may feel like that with this first book because of the way that the story is drawn out. This one is very much character focused, but uh, yeah, you might find some things about it. Not quite up to snuff with a lot of other fantasy series that you are reading. Me, I don't mind it because I'm a character guy. But if you need some serious, heavy, crazy plot and stuff in the first book, uh, this one might drag for you at first. But just trust me, you need to get to know these characters first, and uh, it, it's worth it for the way that he does it. So a big one here, guys, if you aren't into Grimdark. Now, I know the big question is, what is Grimdark exactly? Like I said, you do have no Prince Charmings in this. You do have no evil, 
overlord kind of thing. It is very much can feel at times like every man for himself and I would slip my mama's throat for a nickel. That's very much how it can feel sometimes. And that's not for everyone. That could be a shock for people. If like the darkest thing you've read is Wheel of Time, yeah, this might be something that you're not ready for. Uh, it, it For me, it was like, it was so refreshing. I needed something like that. But I know a lot of people, they don't need to see uh, Joe Abercrombie describing what someone's intestines look like when they fall out of their stomach. He doesn't need to hear you know the F word about 47 times in a chapter. Well, Joe thinks you need to hear that. So if those aren't your things, uh, if a cruel, punishing, sometimes hopeless world that can feel quite depressing sometimes isn't for you, this might not click for you. And Grimdark as a whole might not click for you. For me, like I said, I feel like he has those moments of levity that keeps you from getting just, you know, completely dour. But uh, yeah, it's not going to work for everyone, as is the violence and the bad language isn't going to work for everyone else. But me, I'm a deviant, so it, it just it was everything that I was looking for. But let's go ahead and talk about why I think that you guys should read it. Now, if you're tired of the same old good versus evil fantasy story, I think this is going to give you something new. It's going to give you some damaged characters that you don't expect to be rooting for and you will find yourself doing so even by the end of this first book. Like when I first uh, when I first discovered Galacta in this series, at first I was like, what am I reading? And by the end of this book, I was like, I might have a new favorite character in all of fantasy. And it's amazing because he's not a nice person. He really, really isn't. But I love this story, guys, because even with this first book, it's never predictable. He always hits you with something surprising. When you're not looking for that left jab, he's going to give it to you. And that keeps you on your toes. But for me, in the end, guys, this has some of the most original and memory characters that I have ever read in fantasy. No other author has created characters like this. And there are characters I feel like I know. Like, I feel like these are people that I I wouldn't exactly hang out with, but I know everything about them because of the way that he writes them. And it begins in this very first book where you're getting to know things about them and you want to know more. So I think, again, guys, this is just Joe Abercrombie putting on a clinic for how to create characters. This is a master class in character work. And being a character first guy, this story clicked for me from go. So guys, final thoughts before I go here. When I discovered this book in 2009, I'm not it's not hyperbole to say it changed everything for me. Like I said, I was anxious for another Song of Ice and Fire book. I did end up getting it a couple years later. I haven't got one since, but again, we're not making this series about that. I think this really kind of opened my eyes that there are other great fantasy authors out there in modern times. You know, there are people still writing that are writing good fantasy stories and it made me pick up some other series. I would have never picked up Brandon Sanderson or Mark Lawrence or Andre Sikoski. I would have never tried any of those authors maybe if it wasn't for Joe Abercrombie and The First Law. I would have probably just stuck to, you know, reading uh, Song of Ice and Fire over and over again, or reading The Dark Tower over and over again, and just rereading all my Stephen King and Anne Rice and Michael Crichton books. You know, I would have never really dipped into fantasy. I feel like this one, while I will always say that Lord of the Rings is my favorite fantasy universe, this is my favorite modern fantasy universe because it opened the door to a lot of this you see behind me, guys. A lot of this is because of this. I probably would never have gotten really back heavy into fantasy if it were not for this series. So that's why it's always going to be kind of special for me. And it has raised the bar for every fantasy series that I read now. I do come to expect their characters to be as well constructed as Joe does. Now, I know that's a high bar for me. Uh, other people might not feel the same as I feel. But for me, I want the same care and love put into these characters and to make them feel as original and fresh and not just a rehash of you know some other avatar that I've seen in another fantasy book a million times. I can't think of any character in the series where I'm like, oh, this reminds me of this character from this series. Never. Never, because the characters are so original. But what I didn't know, guys, was this was just the tip of the iceberg. This series takes so many twists and turns after this book. But as far as an introduction goes, could not have been a better time for me. Now, being able to grab book two immediately did help me. And you know what, guys? They're all out now, so you can read them as well. So if you write, if you probably went ahead and picked up this first one and you weren't really wild about it, you like some things, you wish there was a little heavier plot, maybe some questing, you're going to get it in book number two, guys. So stick with it, and I think you're going to have a great time. Because for me, this was my first step into a larger world of fantasy, and I'll for always be thankful for it for that regard. So guys, 
The Blade itself. Have you read it? What did you think? If you want, guys, they are doing a read-along of it on the Discord right now. Jump on the Discord. There's a big group going down there. They just finished Blade itself. They're going to be picking up book two next month. They'll be doing one a month over uh, what, June, July, and August. And I think if they like it, they're going to continue with the sequel book. So there's plenty of First Law stuff out there for you to discover. So if you want to join them, I highly Highly recommend it. So guys, The Blade itself, have you read it? What did you think? Drop in the comments and let me know, and I will talk to you there.